Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Welcome again to another of our virtual services on Friday evening. It's a pleasure to have you joining us, to share both in the worship and to receive the word that God has sent us today. I am standing in for pastor this evening and I'm also bringing the word to us today. So gather around your instruments. Set aside this time for the Lord has sent for us a word that will encourage us greatly through this pandemic, through the difficulties that are facing us and through the uncertainties that we see around us. Let us pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for your wonderful love towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us and chosen us for such a time as this. We thank you, O oh God, that as we just sang, Lord, you won't give up. You won't give in, O oh God. We thank you, you continue to surround us with your wonderful love. And though, Lord, we may not understand, Lord, the signs and everything that's happening around us, and though the enemies will try to bring conflicting thoughts to your people, yet, O oh God, in your faithfulness, you sent your word to bring in correction, you sent your word to bring instruction, and you sent your word, O oh God, to minister your love to our hearts. So I pray that by your spirit, O oh God, you will speak to the hearts of your people this evening. That faith, O oh God, will be strengthened in us, O oh God, as we look, O oh God, unto you, the author and finisher of our faith. Be exalted in your people, be exalted in your church, be exalted in the earth, Lord, in these days, and be glorified, Lord, in your house. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This evening we are in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And the text that I'm ministering on is verse number 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. But to bring the context of, the, of that particular text, we want to read from verse 3. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 7 says, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The text that we want to minister on today is verse 5, as I've said, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And the title of the message is simply, Kept by his power. Hallelujah. As Christians, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are assured by the word of God that we are kept by the power of God through salvation, as we have read in our text. That is an assurance that God is giving us today. And oh, how wonderful it is to receive assurance. And because God is a good shepherd, because he is a good father, because he is love, he knows the assurance that we need. 
and he has selected this word so that it be ministered into our spirit so that we can stand in these last days. This text is comforting and absolutely reassuring. This text that tells us we are kept by the power of God. It is absolutely reassuring and it is comforting. Particularly in these times, times which are characterized by uncertainty and tribulations as we are experiencing what can only be termed as a shaking in our lives as we have come to know and to expect it. We can only understand the circumstances that we are in, that the entire world is in. Now 18 months into a pandemic, 18 months into economic hardship, 18 months into lockdown measures, not only the world but the church, we have all that we know of our lives have been turned upside down. It can only be considered a shaken. And at this such a time when everything is shaken, everything that we know is shaking, only that which cannot be shaken, be, be shaken, be shaken will stand. So it is comforting, I say, for us to have this assurance from God, for, the, for us to have this reminder in Scripture that we are kept by His divine power. Everything has been shaken. Countries have been shaken, governments, economies, our individual wel welfare and well-being, our families, yes, and even the church of Jesus Christ as we have come to know it is experiencing a shaking. Our ease, our comfort and confidence have all been disturbed and many have been left with worry, fear, stress and despair. As adverse events continue to unfold before our very eyes and we are powerless to prevent them. We are looking for betterment and we are getting more locked down. We are looking for, for, for ease and we are under still more stress. We are hoping that once we have been vaccinated and everything is all right, we will go back out, but it does not seem to be straight like that. And we continue under adverse circumstances. Not only the world, but also the church of Jesus Christ. We are unable to have church as we know it. We are unable to fellowship. We are unable to greet each other. We are unable to be encouraged each other by each other face to face. When would, be, when would we be able to do it? We are so uncertain. So it's reassuring and it is comforting to know as I've said, that we are kept, and God is telling us today, saints, that we are kept by his power unto salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. It is in this scenario that the Lord will have us reminded today, those of us who, who, who belong to him, that we are kept by his divine power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said that it is comforting to know that because as Jesus said in John 10, 27, we are his sheep. He said, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. So it is comforting to know that Jesus know his sheep. And in another place, Paul has said, writing to Timothy, he said, the Lord knoweth those who are his. Hallelujah. So it is comforting to know that Jesus said, we are his sheep. And despite the storms, despite the difficulties, despite the trials, despite the temptations and the frustrations under which we continue to exist, no one can pluck us out of his hand. He has said that in John 28. And he is reminding us today, those of us who love him, those of us who trust him, those of us who have received the blessed salvation in his name, those of us who are numbered with the saints, those of us whose names are written in the land book of life, we need not be forlorn. We need not be discomforted. We can know that nothing can pluck us out of his hand. 
hands. And he said it because he wants us to know it. Hallelujah. And furthermore, if that wasn't comforting enough, he said, well, nothing can pluck us out of his father's hands. Reassurance upon reassurance. Comfort upon comfort. Hear it. We are kept by the power of God. Amen. We are a sheep. We hear his voice and he knows us. And no, no one can pluck us out of Jesus' hand. Jesus Christ sits as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the highest of all. No one can pluck us out of his hand. And if we even have a thought that that might happen, he said no one can pluck us out of his Father's hand. It's there he said, I and my Father are one. Hallelujah. So you see the comfort that God is bringing us today, saints. That despite what we may be seeing, despite the explanations that we are not receiving, despite the understanding that is not coming, despite the seeming hopelessness, here God is saying that we are kept, hallelujah, by his divine power. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Now, if we have to appreciate this text and to truly appreciate what the Lord is saying to us today, we have to understand or we have to begin from the beginning and understand first that God is sovereign. I, to say to many, to say to many who may have become fearful, to say to many who may become weak, that you are being kept by God. They will say, yeah, I'm being kept by God, so why is this happening? And why is that happening? And why is that happening? And why is that happening? We sound like Job when we make statements like that. So before we attempted to doubt the scripture that we are kept by the power of God and we begin to murmur and question God, let us first remember, saints, that God is sovereign. That means that he reign, his reign and his authority are absolute and supreme. Let me repeat that. While we are tempted to do like Job and think that it has, what has happened to us is unfair and that I have lost my business and my income and that I do not know how I can start again, and if the Lord had loved me, why this had to happen to me? Why didn't I know so I could have done this and done that and that? Why? And before we, if we have to come into an understanding, the very first thing we need to know today is that Almighty God is sovereign, which means he reign, his reign and his authority are absolute and supreme. There is no one higher. There is no, not even us. No one have the, the authority to ask an account of God as to why. God dealt with Job in that manner. And he had to tell him, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where are you when the wild beasts and the cronies give, give birth in the hills? Do you know the way that the wild eagles stay? Do you know how, where are the fountains of water? He had to challenge Job. He said, who is he who darkened questions? with answers that cannot come forth? He, he said it of Job. Of course, I, I, I paraphrase. He said this to Job when Job was querying all the affliction that came upon him. And he was steadfast. He was holy. And so we are tempted to think, well, if we are the church of Jesus Christ, if we are the ones, uh, if we are preaching the truth of God and God is for us, why are we too suffering the same thing? I need to remind us that God told Elijah to pray for rain, for, uh, to pray for a famine upon the land of Israel. In the days of, 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 of Ahab and, and, and Jezebel, and Elijah had to pray that there would be a famine. And as Elijah prayed, so the famine came, as the Lord said. 
But the famine affected Elijah himself in that God had to tell him, go and hide himself by the brook chariot and he will eat of the, he will drink from the brook and a raven will bring him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening and you will drink of the brook. In other words, though Elijah prayed for the rain, he had to go through the circumstance, prayed for the flood, for the, uh, for the famine, he had to go through the same thing. I'm saying this to us saying so that we do not question God contrary to the word of God. We do not raise questions that are not learned according to the word of God. That's why the Bible is, is the word of God given to us that we can be governed, that we can be instructed, that we can be guided by so that we do not walk in the vanity of our own minds and in the talk that we hear wrong. So not even Elijah, though he, God, tell him to pray for rain, he didn't make him make any provision so that he can live the same standard that he had during the famine. As a matter of fact, when he was by the brook chariot, the word of God says it came to pass that the same brook dried up because there was no rain. God didn't excuse the brook from drying up. At the time when the brook dried up, it was the time to move him on down to Zarephath to the widow woman to receive cake and to receive a different standard of living until he, Elijah, prayed again for rain to come. So I'm saying to us by the Spirit of God that we need to inquire wisely according to the Word of God concerning the circumstances that we are under and not given to fables, not given to old talk, not let the enemy plant, plant wrong thoughts in our minds so as to challenge our faith in God. And this is what we are speaking to this evening, that our faith in God will not be challenged. So because we do not understand what God is doing, that doesn't mean that God is not good. Because we do not understand what will happen tomorrow, that doesn't say that God doesn't love us. God is sovereign. He has created everything for his purpose and for his pleasure. We were told that in Revelation 4.12. So that whatever is God is doing with us in the earth, he created it for himself and for his pleasure. So then who is you and I to say what God should do and not do? I know you say to me, Brother Glenry, so you say that God is bringing the pandemic and God call, is God who has caused all of this? I refer you to the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 6. The end of the verse, he says, will there be evil in a city and the Lord has not done it? And in verse 7, he says, surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveal it unto his prophet, the servants. And I don't have time to go into it now, but this pandemic was revealed to a prophet, to, to a prophet whom we know, even to our own brother Cleveland. He, God revealed it to him. He revealed it to him almost seven months before the pandemic hit. We should go back to that prophecy. Uh, brother C Cleveland referenced it last Sunday when he ministered. He said, he, that prophecy, he said there would come total collapse. Collapse of governments, collapse of economy. Everything, business will collapse. Everything will collapse. A total shutdown. And not only here, but worldwide, every country. And that prophecy came on the 19th of March, 2019. And the pandemic was, was announced on the 30th of December after they have investigated it. So it started a couple of weeks before in China. So we know now, we know that God revealed to us that he is going to bring a shaking. He is going to do it so that we can take comfort in our Father. He knows what he's doing. Whatever God does is good. God is good all the time. And you might think what good could come out of a pandemic. God is able to create a crisis, saints. God is able to do it and bring out of that his glory. Remember, God says, your way is not my way. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways are higher than my ways are higher than your ways, and so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, saith the Lord. So who are, uh, who are we in our carnal understanding, in our limited reasoning to question God? So if we have to receive this comfort, this assurance from God today, what I would call a blessed assurance that we are kept by the power of God, in the face of all the negative circumstances, to believe that and to know that and to stand firm in faith, we must first realize that he is sovereign and that he has created all things for his purpose. We must also understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
It doesn't belong to anyone else. It doesn't belong to America. It doesn't belong to Iran. It doesn't belong to China. It doesn't belong to the bankers. It doesn't belong to the rich people in the world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalms 24.1. So therefore, what I'm saying is that we need to see our lives from God's perspective. We need to see the difficulties that we are undergoing and what we are experiencing from God's perspective. You see, saints, our way or the way of man is rebellious. Our desires are adverse to God. We seek our own pleasure and our own comfort, but God desires our good, for we are his sheep. We are the sheep of his pastures. Remember when God created man, before that he created a garden to put man in. So we are in the earth, man is in the earth for the pleasure of God. Although we have turned our backs on God through sin and want to seek our own pleasure, our own program, our own, our own agenda, we want to have nothing to do with God. Give us all the pleasure, give us all the ease, give us all the comfort, let us behave as we do, let us, let us forget God. But the earth is not yours, the earth is his. The world is his. He loves everyone. And because of the sin, he has sent his son to redeem. So we need to understand that we should see everything that is happening to us. The difficulty, the frustration, the lockdown. See it from God's perspective. Our father who is good, our father who is loving, he is doing something and he is doing something new. The second prophecy that Brother Cleveland brought on the, on the 20th, on the 1st of May last year, the 1st of May last year, he said that God is re-establishing his name in the earth. God is re-establishing his name in the earth. This, this, this pandemic hit even the church of Jesus Christ. God wants to get glory in the church. God wants to get glory in our lives. And God wants to do in, with his people that which pleases him. Hallelujah, for we are to bring glory to, to his son. We are to, conf to be conformed to the image of his son and to bring glory to his name. So if we need to appreciate the assurance, firstly, we need to appreciate the sovereignty of God and that he, is, he, is, he owns everything and everything was designed for his pleasure. Secondly, we, if we have to appreciate the fact that we are kept by God's power, we must also be informed by his dealings with the children of Israel, for that which was written before time was written for our learning. I repeat, if we are to appreciate the word that tells us we are kept by the power of God, we must be reminded of how he dealt with the children of Israel. And why are we going back there? Romans 15, 4 tells us, For that which was written aforetime is written for our learning, so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures will have hope. It is, in the, it is in the scripture that we find our comfort. It is in the scripture that we find our hope. Not in our circumstance. It is in what God says. It is who he is. And that is where our hope is. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous will run into it and are safe. It didn't say that nothing will happen for the righteous. No. The righteous has an ark of safety in the name of the Lord. He is that for us. God is a refuge for us saints. And so this is comforting for us to know. But if we understand how God dealt with the children of Israel, we will understand why he can say to us, listen, you are kept by my power. Now how did God deal with the children of Israel? How did the children of Israel end up in a desert for four, in a wilderness for 40 years. We know the story. They were in bondage in Egypt, but they were God's people. 
and they ended up in a wilderness. A wilderness is an uninhabited place. It cannot be a place of comfort. When they murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, they said, would to God that we were back in Egypt and in, in, by the flesh pots that we were in our comfort. Have you brought us here to die because there are no graves in, 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 in Egypt? Why you brought us in this wilderness? And they murmur and they complain. But let us consider saints that the children of Israel did not reach in the wilderness because they lost their way. The children of Israel did not lo didn't reach in the wilderness because God was spiting them. The children of Israel wasn't wandering in the wilderness for 40 years by themselves. It was God's design. It was God's plan. It was God's purpose. They were all in the will of God, discomforted at times as they were, hardened by circumstances, facing war, facing famine, but they never lacked one time. They were in the will of God. In other words, their, their being in the wilderness is God's doing. It is because God promised Abraham something. That is why they end up in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Our salvation is not our doing. It is because God desire to make us like his son, that he has chosen us in him, in Christ Jesus. That is our salvation. So it is, our, it is not our doing. Just as the children of Israel being in the wilderness, it was not their doing. So it is not our doing that we are facing the circumstances. But hallelujah, we are kept by the power of God. Just as the children of Israel were kept by the power of God, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night to guide them. They stayed 40 years in the wilderness. Their feet never swell. They lacked nothing. They, 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 their shoes never worn out. And for 40 years, God kept them. Hallelujah, until he brought them in to his desired heaven, the, 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 the desired land, the promised land. So what we are seeing, despite its awkwardness, despite its difficulty, despite how rough it is, we know that our God is a good God, and he is able to perform that which he has desire for us. And God desires good things for us. He said it in um, Jeremiah, that the thoughts and plans I have for you, they are not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of peace, so that you will have the expected end. It was not their doing, I said, it was God's doing. For God made a promise to Abraham, and he was fulfilling that promise. The misery, if you want to call it, or the, or the bewilderment of the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years was because of God's plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is comforting. So whatever hardship I would go through, whatever hardship I would encounter, I have nothing to worry about that because it is all God's plan and his ways are good. Remember, saints of God, God's way is not our way. We would like him to keep us in the penthouse of the Ritz Carlton in New York and give us everything from there and, and treat us nice with all that we could have. That is our concept of goodness. But God who is good, he knows best, amen? He knows best. God made a promise to Abraham and he was fulfilling it. So everything that they encountered and experienced in the wilderness was because of God, not because of them. It is not because the children of Israel sinned that they end up in the wilderness. No, 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 no. God was moving them out of bondage into their own land. <coughs> Excuse me. God was going to displace nations for them. God was going, listen, there were kingdoms of the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites. They were moving into, into kings, popular kings, big kings, Og, the king of Bashan, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, glorious nations. God had that for them. But here they were in the wilderness going to conquer it, going to come into the possession of it. But they did not know it. Couldn't that be like us? We are looking at the greatness of God that is about to unfold in our lives, but it is in the form of a pandemic. 
We are about to see maybe the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, 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 the end of all things, the culmination of history, when our salvation draw it nigh for. This is what our text says, we are kept by faith, by the power of God through faith, unto salvation. It is ready to be revealed. And we look into the pandemic. Our glory is around the corner. And if it is not that the Lord is coming immediately, it is that he is making something new. He is going to bring it. You know, after the harsh winter, then you come the spring. After the harsh winter, you come the beautiful season of spring and then summer. But you have to go through the harsh winter. But despite all their troubles, all their wars, all their fears, I'm talking of the children of Israel, all their hunger and their long journey, God never left them nor forsake them. God sustained them. He guarded and protected them and performed for them that which he promised and planted them in the land of Canaan just as what he told Abraham. He told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15:4. He said, know this assuredly. At that time, he was Abraham. He was Abram. He said, know this assuredly, that your seed will be a stranger, will be a stranger in a strange land. They will be captive in a strange land. And they will be evil and treated for 400 years. He told that to Abraham even before he changed his name. But I will bring them out and I will judge that nation. Hallelujah. And this is what God was doing. When, when we think that they were going through from pillar to post and wandering aimlessly, they were well smacked up in the purpose of God. The ways of God are way better than the ways of man. The way and the ways of God are past finding out. If, if, if it were easy for us to discern, if it were easy for us to understand, then there will be no need to trust God. We know the outcome. But because we do not understand, because it is some, there is some uncertainty, because there will be times of, 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 of lack of clarity, there will be some times of anxiety, there will be some times of lack and hardship, there will be some times of hurt, there will be some times of pain, but we can rest assured that we are in the hands of the master. For he said we are kept by his power, by the power of God, through faith unto salvation. Hallelujah. I'm getting excited. Or oh, probably you thought I'd get excited already. But this is wonderful to know. You see, it's wonderful to know because many times we feel weak. I don't know about you. Many times we feel to give up. I don't know about you. Many times we wonder why we make the mistakes we make and we are trying. I don't know about you, but I've come to realize through this word that it is the trying of our faith that is more precious, the trust in God to see if we will give up. Hallelujah. So let the tribulation come. It is almost like when Paul, after he had prayed thrice that God will remove his stone, and, and the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't worry about the stone. My grace is sufficient. Paul said, well, most gladly, I will rejoice in infirmity, in my weakness, for when I'm weak, I am strong. Why? Because he will give me his grace. Paul could have rejoiced because God promised him his grace. And so we can rejoice because God has promised us that same grace. And more than that, he is saying to us uh, that I am keeping you by my power. Hallelujah. I know what's in your mind, you know. Brother Glenary, how you could say this and all these things are happening, but I'm coming to that. I'm Let's finish the analogy here with the children of Israel in the, in the garden, in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 4, Moses said, Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9.21, which is an excellent account of Nehemiah um, in prayer before God concerning his dealings with the children of Israel, he said, Yea, 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, their feet was not swollen. Same thing like what Moses said. 
So although you and I will look and say, boy, they had no home, they had no certain dwelling place, they were, on, they were in an uninhabited land, but they were here, they were the heirs apparent to all the land of Canaan that to this day continue to be a source of problems in the world because God has planted Israel in the land that he has. Bless his name. And he has given us that physical example that we could understand that if he was so faithful in the physical thing, much more the spiritual thing, the realm and the dominion where he dwells, where he desires to have us participated in his kingdom and his glory, much more he will be faithful in spiritual things. Hallelujah. So just as the children of Israel's salvation from Egypt was not their own doing, so too is it with ours. Just as God sustained them and brought them into his promised land, so too he will do for us. Have no fear. He will not abandon us. We will not die. We will not perish. That is what Jesus Christ said. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall not perish. And no man will take them out of my hand. John 10, 27 and 28. For he that has begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Saints, has God, has God performed, has God begun a good work in you? Hasn't his spirit in you testified to you that you have received the salvation of God? No, 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 I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about the Spirit of God that is a witness to you. I'm talking about the comforter that he has sent in your heart to assure you that even despite your weakness, that I have sealed you this day as my servant, as my child. Hallelujah. And he dispenses grace and continues to work in us to bring us from glory to glory. Don't you have that assurance? If you do not have your insurance, we ought to examine ourselves so that having been buffeted by the uncertainty of the circumstances, by the hardship of our, by the worry, by the fear, by the anxiety, having allowed the enemy to, uh, to, to, to abuse our minds, let us now be refreshed by the word of God and realize what he has done for us and what he has done in us. Just as the children of Israel were kept by the power of God, so too we who are who believe in Jesus Christ. God kept them through the wilderness for 40 years. You think he will not keep us in Christ Jesus? And more so, look what he has done. He put them in the wilderness, but he put us now in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but... Be of good cheer. Why? Because we are in him and he has overcome the world. Let the word of God reassure us this evening. Let the word of God stir us up this evening. Let the word of God be our confidence. Let it be the anchor for our soul because God is sending it at this time in the pandemic to cause all who love him, all who fear him, all who trust him to stand fast for he is the God of angel armies. He will not give up. He will not give in. He surrounds us with our love and 40 pounds pandemic will come, but it cannot shake our God, for he is an unchanging God. Hallelujah! He is an awesome God, and we must once again rise up to the reality of the awesomeness of God in us, and stop thinking things after our own mind. Think on the word of God, what God says, for that will not pass. It will not come to pass. It will not pass away, rather, until it is fulfilled. Now, however, just as they were tried in the wilderness, so too we will be tried. And we are being tried. And the trial is to see if our trust in God will remain. And that is what we read in verse 7, that the trial of your faith. Remember in Deuteronomy 8, 8, 1, Moses said that he, he, he suffered you to hunger and to try you and to know what was in your heart. It is always trying. We ought to be tried. Many times we stand and we raise our hands and we worship. And okay, we think that we have given God all the honor. But God knows how to get honor out of our lives. He will take us through circumstances. And he is saying, trust me. Trust me. Make me a shepherd. I will lead you in green pastures. I will restore your soul. I am your shepherd. The sheep doesn't tell the shepherd where it should graze. The sheep has to wait until the shepherd brings Brings it by still waters. Bring it into, into, into green pastures. I never see any sheep telling any shepherd where you want to eat. Yeah. 
But thank God, although we are to be tried, we are in Christ, who is able to keep us from falling and to present us falseless before his presence of his glory with exceeding joy. There can be no... There, let me back up with that. Though we are being tried, yet we are in Christ. And that is why he said, abide in me. Because if we do not abide in him, we cannot make the journey on our own. Without Christ, we can do nothing. So it is so important for us to see ourselves in Christ. And if we see ourselves in Christ, then we have the confidence that we are kept by the power of God. That deserves an amen. So here we are saying in our main text this evening that God has given us assurance that we are kept by his divine power. Hallelujah. But there can be no keeping by God without faith and trust. That's why our text said specifically, who are kept by the power of God through faith, through trust, through belief. It is very important to understand how God keeps us. For God cannot keep us if we have no faith in him. God cannot keep us if we do not trust him. Our faith and our trust is the avenue, is the, is the open door for the power of God to work in our lives. God needs our faith that he has given us through his word, incidentally. He needs our faith. We are not idle participators in it. We ought to believe God and we will see his power in our lives. Didn't Jesus tell Martha that? He said, Martha, Martha, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see the power of God? That belief is faith. That belief is trust. For us to believe that we are kept by the power of God and that we will make it, not with, notwithstanding the fact that we fell seven times. My Bible tells me the just man fall seven times, but God holds him up. So notwithstanding our weakness, notwithstanding the trials and temptation, notwithstanding the fears and the uncertainty, yet God is saying that I, have, I keep you by my power, but by the faith that you put in me. That is the mechanism. That's what that part of our text is explaining us. That the mechanism of God keeping us is our trust in him. Let us examine this a little more. Although God has all power to keep, our faith in him is needed to affect his keeping. I repeat that. Although God has all power to keep, and many will say, well, yes, well, okay, if God keeping me, I have nothing to do. No, 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 no. That is why I read verse 7 of the text as well. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 7. That the trying of your faith, for, for God to keep you, for you and I to experience the power of God, that faith that we say we have in him, that trust that we put in him is going to be tried. So Satan is going to He's going to use the pandemic. He's going to buffet us. We're going to see finances literally fly away. We will find ourselves needing to be assisted more than we ever have before. We have lost our independence, but we have not lost God, for he is the one who is keeping us. Oh, we would like to be able to do everything we want when we want. We would like to be self-sufficient and independent of everything. Sometimes independent of God himself. We don't even want to pray, give us our this day our daily meal. Our pantry is full. The fridge is overflowing. And we have all that we can have. What you're praying for, we even live without God. We'll go back to church tomorrow. Let's go here. Let's go there. We have no time for God. We would like to be in that state. And then the enemy takes our heart away and we lose everything that God has promised us in Christ Jesus. So although God has all power, he is omnipotent, our faith in him is what is needed to affect his keeping. For our faith opens the door to God's entrance. By our faith, remember Jesus Christ said that he stands at the door and knocks. 
And if any man hears his voice and open, Jesus will knock, but he won't open the door. That is not how God works. And I will explain to you why shortly. This is the object of all temptation we face. The object or the purpose of it is to try our faith. Since it is God that saves, we didn't save ourselves. We heard the message and we know the verse that by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. We do not or did not save ourselves. Well, therefore, how can we keep ourselves? We did not begin our salvation. It's he who began it. So, yes, he is going to complete it. This is comforting and reassuring. To know that contrary to what religion tell you, that you have to do this and do this and do this. And we seek, you know, religion as we always hear is man's way of pleasing God. And we feel comfortable when we do a set of things that are pleasing in God's eye. And we think that that justifies us. No, 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 that is not God's way. That's your way. God's way is that he has begun through faith in us a work. A work of salvation to transform us into the very image of his son. Why? Because he loves his son so much that he wants his son to be the firstborn among many brethren. Hallelujah. We are called for glorious purpose as we've ministered uh, uh, two Sundays ago. So that God, it is God that saves. It is God that guards. It is God that is able to keep us from falling and to present us And to to give us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. It is God who does it. Again, am I saying there is nothing we must do? No. We need to keep our faith in God. We need to believe God. We need to trust God. We need to look to him. And that looking to him, faith, there's a gaze of our soul unto God. Opens up the door for his power to work in our lives. Faith is the invitation for God's power to stay us. If we lose faith then we have, dis- we have dispersed with God's power. The invitation of his power is not given in our lives. Although God can keep, he has all power, but this is the way he works. That's why it is said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. You be asking, why must I have faith in order for God's power to work in me? When Jesus healed the blind man that's in, in Matthew 9 after he had dealt with the, the, uh, the woman with the infirmity for, for 18 years that was bowed on and touched the hem of his garment uh, for, for, for 12 years and, t- and touched the hem of his garment and then the two blind men followed him and they cried out. That's when he came from Jairus' house, Sarah's daughter. And he, and he asked them, he said, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they say, yes, Lord. And he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Jesus Christ was announcing a law and a principle, a spiritual law of the kingdom of God, that it is according to our belief in God that he works. Didn't Paul say who was able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask and think according to the power that dwelleth in us, that power dwells in us through faith. Faith, faith is the window. Faith is the window that brings the light of God into our soul. Faith is the window that brings the fresh air into our lives. Faith is the window through which we open, the blind through which we throw open to bring God into our circumstance so that we can enjoy the freshness of life and the strength that we need in Christ Jesus. If not, we just keep our blind shut and we remain in darkness. Let us understand this to explain why we need to have faith for the power of God to keep us. Simple. If we have faith in him, it's because we want him. If we have faith in God, it's because we are depending on him. If we do not want him, he cannot, we cannot have him. If we, if we do not want God, how could we have him? We won't look to him. Faith is looking to God. Trusting in him. If we do not want him, we cannot have him. If we do not know that we need him, we cannot have him. You know, there are many who don't really know that they need God. And that's why we have to preach the word of God and, and witness to those who are blinded by really false religion. They think that they are all right. But if they do not know, then they cannot have God. If we do not trust that God will come to us and help us, then we will not have him. And that is what faith does. 
Faith makes us know that we need God, we look to him. Faith makes us aware of our weakness and our strength in God. That's what faith does. Faith makes us know that when we call upon his name, he will answer, for that is what he has said. And then we will have him. But if we do not do that, then how would we have him? We would turn away from God. Or we would go to church, we will do religious things. Or we will acknowledge that there is a God, but we will, we will not seek his influence and, his, and we will not depend on him. We will seek to depend on our own strength and on our own effort. Salvation here and in the thereafter is God's work alone. It cannot be exercised towards a man who has no faith. And it certainly will be exercised to anyone who has faith in God. I repeat that. Our salvation, whether well here, the experience of being a born again now, and to have eternal life with Christ in the hereafter, that salvation is God's work alone. But it cannot be exercised towards a man who has, not, who has no faith. And it will be certainly be exercised towards a man who has faith. That is why the word of God says, how will they believe if they have not heard? And how will they believe in whom? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear if there is no preacher? That is the word of God. That's why I say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And today I pray that through this message that our faith will be strengthened, our faith will be encouraged when we know that all we need to do is to look to the cross just as Jesus Christ was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Now we need to look at him lifted up as Lord of all. He sits as God. He he sits as Lord of Lords. He sits as King of Kings. There is no greater than him. The world is at his feet. Everything is under his control. And when we have that faith and we look to him, and whatever the tide may come, whatever the difficulty, however the wind blow, if our boat will mash up and we have to swim to shore, yet we know that he will preserve us and then he is able to build us and reestablish us again. Hallelujah. God has given us a reassurance that we are kept by his power unto salvation. Our unbelief, however, can thwart God's omnipotence. And let us remember that as I come in for a close. Our unbelief can thwart God's omnipotence and hinder Christ's all loving purpose in us. Now remember that not all the children of Israel who came out of Egypt entered the promised land. Not all. Scripture tells us that they entered not because of unbelief. So because of lack of faith, we can thwart God's omnipotent power in our lives. We can thwart, not God thwart. He will never give up as we sang. He will never give in. He surrounds us with our love. But if we should be deceived, if we should be turned away in discouragement, if we will turn away in blindness and ignorance, if we will turn away, if we will be turned away from the truth that is in Christ Jesus, then we rob ourselves from that that he desires to give us. Faith is the means by which the saving and the keeping power of God enters the soul and accomplishes God's salvation work in us to the very end. This is why, saint of God, I close by saying, this is why the word of God says, without faith, it is impossible to, to, impossible to please him. So as we end this message tonight, we want to remember, hallelujah, that God began our salvation, and he who have begun a good work will complete it in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. God has begun it. It's so wonderful to know. It is so wonderful to know. It is so easy to know that he is there for us. It's so easy to know that it is not by our might or by our ability, but by his very spirit of love and power that he has shared in our hearts. Oh, I pray that we will allow God by his spirit to help us to live the life of faith that we are called to do, forgetting the things that are behind 
and looking onto the things that are before and running the race of salvation that is set before us as Christ, our example, did. Hallelujah. Let us sing this song.
Let us pray. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, oh, how we thank you for your wonderful word. Oh, how we thank you for your wonderful love. And as we sang, Lord, that we are in your world and that we are in your hands and that we can forever trust your plan. Today, O oh God, I pray for your people, those who have heard this message now, those who would hear a subsequent recording of this word, those, O oh God, who will stumble, O oh God, upon this at some time. I pray, O oh God, that you would speak to the hearts of all, oh Lord, who have put their trust in you, that you are a faithful God, and that you, O oh God, have begun a wonderful work in us. We know, Lord, that your people, we have suffered much adversity, some more than others. We are suffering pain. We are suffering sickness. We are suffering, Lord, discouragement, hardships, O oh God. But in spite of it, O oh Lord, because of your word and because of who you are, we know we can trust your plan, for your plans for us are good. Thank you, Father. May this word, O oh God, that we are kept by your power, by the power of God, through faith unto salvation. May it remain in our spirit, at, in our spirits and our hearts at this time. May we meditate on it, O oh God. May, O oh God, the analogy of the children of Israel having come out of their bondage, O oh God, in Egypt unto a glorious inheritance that you had promised them, Lord, and you were faithfully fulfilling. May that analogy, O oh God, bring clarity to our minds that we can see the similarity of your dealing with us, Lord, for what you have for us in Christ Jesus to be revealed, O oh God, in, the, in due time is glorious, Lord, beyond, O oh God, our imagination. So I pray, Father, for not only an understanding and a revelation of this truth to be deepened in our hearts and in our spirits, but I pray, O oh God, for an encouragement in our hearts, an encouragement in our minds, and that we will be reminded, O oh God, that the testimony of our Lord must be our delight, for it is when your testimonies, what you have done in the past, what you have done for others, what you have done, O oh God, as an, an example, O oh God, it's your testimony testimonies, O oh God, that make us wise, that remove the simplicity of our faith, the simplicity of our belief, the simplicity of religion, that it removes it from our mind, for we know you are faithful, we know you are good. So I pray for every member of this congregation, of this ministry, Holiness Revival Ministries, and all friends, O oh God, and those who join us near and afar. I pray, O oh God, that they will take, that we all will take our eyes away, O oh God, from the adversity around us and to focus it now on you, for you are keeping us by your divine power. Oh, glory be to your name. Let your name be glorified in us and through us, Father. Let your name be glorified through your church in this hour. Let your word go forth, Lord, in the demonstration of your power. But let, it be, let your kingdom be demonstrated through the ministry of your word, oh God. I pray now for the divine healing on the bodies of your people. I pray, oh God, for peace on the minds of your people. I pray, oh God, for strength where there is weakness, oh God. I pray for hope where there is despair. I pray, oh God, for the confidence that we will triumph in your name, Lord, because we are kept by your power and because you have assured us of your love. We thank you, Father. We bless you. We praise you. We magnify you. And we say, let your will be done in us. Let your will be done in us that it is in heaven. Let your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Let it be done in the church of Jesus Christ as it is in heaven. In this time in the earth. And may your glory be seen in Jesus' holy name we pray. And the saints of God say, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this evening. As I said, I have deputized for pastor today. 
He's okay, he sends his love as always. Here we are always faithful in bringing the word of God to you. Notwithstanding us being far, God has afforded us a platform and an opportunity to share the word of God. And although there are empty seats and there are few in the sanctuary, who it's a blessing to have them here, uh, we know that the word of God is going forth. And as we pray that the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, will be exalted in the earth, for he is the only hope of the nation. And saints of God, notice that we have the hope of the nation. We have the hope of God. And let our light so shine before men, even now, even the glory of God in our lives, that they would come to know the peace that we have found in Christ Jesus. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name and invite you to join us again on Sunday morning at 7, at 9 p.m., sorry, at Sunday morning at 9 p.m., at 9 a.m. I'm not accustomed to doing this. Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we will be here to bring us another service so that we'll be strengthened and built up as the people of God. For we need the word of God to keep us and to stabilize us. God bless. Stay safe. We love you. Hallelujah.